Thank you very much, Brother Joshua. Let's pray together one more time. Our Father, we give you honor and praise for your hand upon our lives. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to come back uh, for this Bible study. Thank you for all our brothers and sisters that are uh, coming together for this Bible study in different parts of the world. We thank you, God, for uh, those that are gathering as centers who are meeting as groups, those that have taken this as their weekly Bible study, either in their local churches or in their discipleship classes. Our Father, we are grateful to you for doing this for us. And those that are sitting as families, those that are just on their own connecting, uh, either on this uh, Zoom platform or the YouTube or any other platform, the Telegram, the, the Mixer and all the means by which you are connecting us. We ask, oh God, that you come among us. Our desire this afternoon and this morning is for you to reach out to us. We have been asking you to show us victory over the old nature. Thank you for the song of victory that our brethren brought to us in Christ Jesus. We ask, Lord, that each one that is sitting in this meeting today, they will touch that victory. They will walk into that victory and they will let that victory uh, be established by their lives. We are praying, oh God, that uh, what you did at Calvary will never be wasted on any of our lives. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank God for how God has brought us together again. And for each one of us, uh, wherever you are, we appreciate you and we continue to trust God that as we continue to sit around the word of God together, the Bible says that, that sanctify them that, by thy by that truth, thy word is truth. We are trusting that God's word uh, will continue to produce in us the kind of life that Christ is being desiring for us to live. So as we behold him in the world, we have been changed, we have been transformed, we have been transfigured into the same likeness as he is, uh, even from one degree of glory to another. Now, if you remember last week, we began to look at victory over self. We began to look at what is God's way out. And as we began, we said, the first step is to deny yourself. And then we started looking at what does it mean to deny self? And we spent all the time uh, last, last time to understand the meaning of the word deny. And then we saw from different versions that we read that to deny self, it's not just about denying some externalities to self. Uh, it's not like saying deny your clothes or deny your uh, bed. All of those things, they may come in, but they are not the issues. They are not the issues at all. God is talking about self, self-life, yourself. Not your things, but yourself. And I made emphasis on that quite a lot last week, that what is the entrance onto God's work in our life? Is this enemy within the flesh? And as we begin to study, we see what has God done? What is God's provision uh, for our deliverance from self-life? So, but today we are going to begin from uh, page 62 of this particular book, we're going to look at that number two, hand yourself over to the elder. But uh, I quite recognize that 
what we want to study in that uh, Deuteronomy 21 uh, is an, an analogy. So we will need to first set a background for it so that when we go on to look at that Deuteronomy, it's not going to be vague, it's not going to be abrupt, and it's not going to look what is the relevance of this. And that will answer several of the questions that we're trusting God to help us answer. Now, I would like us to note that Deuteronomy 21, I want all of us to go to Deuteronomy 21, and verse 18 to 23, uh, our sister Marian uh, will be reading that for us. Uh, sister Marian comes to us from uh, Canada, and um, our sister Teresita will also be on the platform reading for us. She comes to us from Belize, and Brad Joshua is already coordinating, and uh, I'll be watching how God helps us on as we go. Let's take Deuteronomy 21, verse 18 to 23, uh, before we begin to uh, draw issues out of it. Deuteronomy 21, from verse 18. Yes. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18 says, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them. Amen. Go on reading. You read down to verse 23. Then his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gates of his city. And they shall say to the elders of, the, of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. If a man has committed sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is given you as an, as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, before we begin to study this, we need to be asking ourselves, what is the connection what we started talking about, uh, the nice self, and this particular uh, text that we need to study elaborately today as the law will be permitting us. And the first thing I want you to note is that this passage was the passage that was uh, the anchor for the decision of the St. Andrew Council to agree to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to go far in the New Testament, how was it applied so that we can return to this passage more deliberately. Now, if you take your scriptures, uh, let's go to Galatians chapter three. Now, Galatians chapter three is not reflected in our book right now, but you can please add it on your own notes because we want to see the connection between um, uh, Deuteronomy and what we have been talking about uh, in the matter of the nine seven. How do we gain victory over self? Let's go quickly to Galatians chapter three. In Galatians chapter three, uh, all of you, please, let's go there. We'll be doing this study very uh, steadily, but we need to all spend time to look at the scripture together. Now, Galatians chapter 3, let me request Brother Joshua to read from verse 13 for us. Galatians 3, 
Uh, verse 13, Galatians 3 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Amen. Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Thank you very much. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ was to be crucified, this was the passage that became the basis for the leaders of uh, the Jews uh, to crucify him on the cross. They say, and now this scripture say, Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law, having become a cause for us. For it is written, cost is everyone who hangs on a tree. So the question for us is, how did Jesus, who knew no sin, how did Jesus, who had always pleased the Father, because severally the Father would stand and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How did that Jesus now qualify to become cursed and to be hung upon a tree. Now that is what uh, we were looking at that brought us back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, where that passage was actually quoted. Now you remember that in John chapter three, Let's again go to John chapter 3, Sister Teresita. If you are on, let's look at John chapter 3. When Jesus Christ was responding onto the question that uh, Nicodemus asked, how can a man who had been born of his mother and is old, how can he be born again? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, you will notice that why Jesus Christ was responding to that, uh, if you go with us to verse 14. Sister Teresita, can you pick John chapter 3 from verse uh, 13, 14 for us up to verse 15? Can we read that? John, John chapter three, 3, verses yes. 13 to 15. Yes. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. You read verse 16, which is the natural conclusion of that passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you. So what we're talking about is that we saw Jesus Christ himself pointing at the fact that even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness for the deliverance of the people. He also was referring to the fact that for us to be delivered, for us to have another life, for us to be uh, delivered from the life we, in, into which we were born. You remember that all through our discussion, we said, you don't learn self-life. It is inherent. It is inherited by birth, and that everyone that is born of a woman actually is born into the flesh and into self-life. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And the question of, so how can these things be? 
How can a man transit from carrying the life of the flesh into bearing the life of the spirit? And it will be permanent experience. How can somebody do that? Now, in response to that, Jesus Christ again said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Because, you know, if I read verse 16, he said, For God so loved the world, that is, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he gave him up for us, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, when we talk about everlasting life in this passage, or eternal life, apart from the fact of the understanding of everlasting, he's talking about a species of life. It's talking about a kind of life that is not animal life, that is not the natural life. It is another life. Jesus said, uh, uh, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So you can see that we are talking about life, not just existing. Not just uh, just waking up, sleeping. We're talking of a life, a life that overcomes, a life that is eternal, a life that's everlasting, a life that is continuous. Of course, a life that we are to live every other thing. So we're saying that that life is only going to be possible as the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, this being lifted up is talking about him being put on the cross, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness for our deliverance. But now the question that we are raising is that how does that connect with our self-life and what do we need to do about it? Now, when that passage was now quoted as the basis, as the reason why Jesus Christ had to be accursed because cursed be he that angered on the tree as it is written. Now, if you are reading your Bible, you will notice that the Bible reference that Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 referred to is the Deuteronomy that we are reading today. Now, so we want to go back very quickly to study that uh, Deuteronomy 21 and look at what is its a particular implication for us and what is the application of that for our deliverance from the life of the flesh. So I want us to go back now. We'll start, pick it little by little and begin to study it. Let's go quickly with me to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 to 23. Uh, please return back there if you uh, have opened it before. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 21 and verse, verse 18. That's where we're going to start from. Now, the passage is said that they refer to in Galatians 3, 13 is... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, no, chapter 21. Oh my God, I'm missing my own line. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21. And let's look at the particular verse that uh, they refer to before we set the context for it. Uh, in verse, uh, verse 23, isn't it? Say, so if a man has committed a sin deserving death and is put to death and you hang him on a tree, verse 23, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defy the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is 
hanged is a cost of God. That was what Galatians 3.13 was referring to, that Christ had become a cause for us. For it is written, cause be he that hangeth upon a tree, that we might become a partaker of the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus. Now, so if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, and if we were to start verse 23, now it will not give us the context. That's why we need to return back to that verse 18. So let's all go back and pick Deuteronomy from chapter 21 and verse 18, as we now take it up one by one. Now you will notice that the first issue that was raised that is giving us an instruction here, he said, uh, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, this is verse 18, who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, Now, that gives us a very, very graphic, graphic description of what we are dealing with in terms of our own self-life that need to be brought to be hanged, you know, on the tree. He said, if a man has a stubborn and a rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them. Please go quickly to verse 20. Look at what they say, still furthermore, about this child. He says, and when, and they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a gluten and a drunkard. We are tired of him. So what are we noting? We are saying that now the Bible is giving a picture of a situation where you have someone in your household, a son. Everything you have done to correct him, everything you have done to uh, guide him, to chasten him, or to even discipline him, has not worked to the extent that the family have decided that it were better for that child to be handed over to the elders of the city for him to be stoned to death or to be crucified so as to put away the evil. If you look at the Bible, it said in verse 21, then all the men of the city shall come, shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, it was touching to me that when they say you shall put away the evil, it meant then that that son has become the embodiment of the evil. As if, if we continue to maintain or retain this boy, we will continue to keep the evil within our bosom. So the question for us is, how did Jesus qualify to, to fall into this criteria they used to put him on the cross? And the only way for us to note that is the Bible saying, he who knew no sin became sin. He who knew no sin became a cause that we might become a partaker of the divine nature. So we want to study that very deeply and see how God will bring us out of this deliberately as we go on. Now, so let's quickly look at what does that stubborn and rebellious son represent in our own case? What does he represent? And what must we do you will notice that number A under our study says you must have become tired of yourself 
and its various manifestation to the point that you want to get rid of it, to the point that you don't even intend to keep it within your bosom anymore. You can't defend it anymore because you are tired of it. So let's quickly pick uh, Romans 7, and we're reading from verse 13 to verse 24. Uh, we'll go back to Sister Marianne again to pick Romans 7, 13 to 24. We're only uh, underscoring that with 21, 18 of the Thessalonians that say, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his voice, the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they are chasing him, he will not heed to them. He will not, he will not submit. Now, let's look at how the Bible describes that for us in Romans chapter 7 from verse 13. Romans 7, Sister Maria. Romans 7 verse 13 to 24 says, Has then what is good become dead to me? Certainly not, but sin, that is, might appear, as, might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to, for what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer who I do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For two will is, for two will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer who I do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is evil is that evil is present in me, within me. The one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, war warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Maria. Now. I know that you can identify with Romans chapter 7. I know you can understand the struggle of trying to overcome self by yourself. I know you have understood the implication of that particular explanation. But before I will... Uh, go quickly to look at it in, in a very little detail before we go on. I want you to note that uh, as we keep discussing from Romans chapter 7, you will see that we have been using the singular word sin. We have not been talking about sins. We have not been talking about sins because we know that sins are the works that the manifestation of Mr. Flesh. But Mr. Flesh himself, the producer of all the sins, is what we are referring to here now as sin. So, and you can see that the way they used it, they used the word sin in that passage, not as an activity, but as a personality. Just as we had been speaking about Mr. Flesh, Mr. Iniquity, we have been speaking about self-life, so again we are seeing the word of God giving us another word, sin. And if you want to put it together, it will have been called maybe the sin, the sinful nature, 
or the the yeah the embodiment of sin. So when we talk about sin here, we're not just talking about oh fornication, anger, and all of that. We are talking about the sin nature that produces all of this. The sin nature that causes all of those products to come out. And if you are reading Romans chapter 7, as we are picking it now, we are seeing that sin, as a person, dwells inside. It operates from inside. That's why you are seeing words like uh, the thing that was good, the law that was good, that should have made somebody to live right. But you see, it was impossible. According to Romans chapter 8, he said, Mr. Flesh rendered the law important. Even though you know that this is what is good, this is what you want to do, but there is someone inside that makes it impossible for you to be able to do that. And so we are describing it uh, from Romans chapter 7 here, and we are saying that, look, he said, the thing that was good, as it become dead to me, certainly not. But see that it might appear seen. So that sin might come out in its true color. As produced, was producing death in me. So I wanted to know that sin that we are talking about here is the producer. Is the producer of all the wrong things. Even if we pluck off all the products and we did not get to the root of the tree, it will produce again. This is why we are going beyond all the confession of sins and all of that, which we did in the course of our last meetings. But we are coming now to say, Lord, where is the axe that you lay on the root of the tree so that we can get rid of that lifestyle? can get rid of the sinful nature so that we can now walk in the newness of life that Christ has brought us into. He said, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful, so that it may appear, it may become, it may show forth its true color. That's what the law came to do. And permit me to say to you that even from the beginning, the Ten Commandments that God gave does not have power to make the people live right. The reason is because the life they carry, the sinful nature inside them, cannot be correct, and it cannot be corrected by the works of law. He said, who is man that is born of a woman that should be clean? So no matter how the law was written, celebrated, you saw that they kept breaking it. They broke the law. And I want to again say that the law has not been able to deal with the sinful nature in the life of man. And all over the world, in any race, in any generation, the law has not been able to deal with the sinful nature inside man. Even those of you that are living out there in a very regulated system where the policing is very strong, when anything you do, the police is, you know, just there. People may look as if they are conformed, as if they are keeping to the law, but inside of themselves, they are offenders. Inside of themselves, just allow the traffic light to go just for one second you will see the animalistic behavior in the society. You said the people that look organized now, you will see what will come out. It's because the man inside, the law cannot deal with it. The law has no power, has no capacity to deal with Mr. C. So he said, look, what I'm doing, even though I know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I am sold on that sin. I am captured on that sin. What I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, what I want to have done, 
that I do not practice. Rather, what I hate is what I do. And you see that many times, people know that what they are doing is not right. They don't want to do it, but they don't have strength not to do it. Sometimes you see yourself going into things. You say, I know that this thing I want to do is not correct. I know that this thing I'm doing is not correct. But you can't stop it because the sinful nature cannot even be controlled by your promise. When you say, I will not do this again, that does not stop Mr. Flesh from ravaging you and, and doing what he wants to do inside of you. So the need to get rid of the evil is the issue that we are dealing with here. How do I get of the evil within me? I think uh, as we read, our sister read one of the verses, and I want you to look at it now. In verse 18, he said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. But maybe I should read from verse 17. But now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I really wish we can lay that concept because I'm trusting God that before we finish this particular uh, section, we'll be able to also to say that it's no longer I that is living, but Christ that is living in me. The way, the reason why you have behaved the way you have behaved, the reason why sin had been producing all that he produced and all the activities that we are talking about the flesh, the reason why it is there is because it is the sin that dwells in me that is producing this. If I don't want that, uh, that thing to be produced again, I must uproot the producer so that another life may come in and begin to produce the kind of desirable results that God is looking for. He said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good to us. For to will is present with me. I always have a will to do something good. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will do, I will to do, I do not do. For the evil I will not to do, that's what I see myself practicing. Now, you now say, now if I do what I will, I will not to do, it is clear that it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, this very important understanding that Paul is presenting to us is critical in you getting victory. It's very critical that the producer of all the behaviors that we have been talking about is sin that dwells inside. It's the sinful nature. It's what I have been calling Mr. Flesh all along. That's what the Bible has referred to as the works of the flesh. If we keep studying, you see that it is the enemy inside. It is the one that will not allow you to please God. So Romans 8 said, those who live according to what their human nature tells them to do, they are the enemies of God. So what it means that is, if we are going to have victory, that victory has to do with bringing that Mr. Flesh, Mr. Sin, out and taking him to where he can be handled. And that's where the uh, Deuteronomy passage is coming. He said, if any man, if a man, you have a son. I'm referring back now to my Deuteronomy. Uh, we only came to Romans chapter 7 because we wanted to establish that this rebellious son we are talking about in Deuteronomy is Mr. Flesh, is the sinful nature, is Mr. Sin that dwells within us. So let's go over that again. Uh, 2118. 2118, please. Uh, we have to keep coming and going because we're, we're in that passage. He said, now, the question that is coming is that if you look at that man, he said, if a man has a stubborn and a rebellious son, 
who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city, and they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn. Now, the first question is that, have you been able to identify within your own hand as well, within your own personal life, this rebellious and stubborn son that has been impossible for you to tame, that you have worked hard, sometimes you have fasted, sometimes you have done all you know how to do, but just, just, just in a moment, he breaks all the rules. He goes beyond. He does the thing that you don't want to do. And you see yourself doing what you know you should not be doing, but that's what you see yourself doing. Have you come to that point? Have you seen that, ah, so this self-life they are talking about has been with me, has been my own, has been running my life down. Have you seen that the, the difficulty in your marriage is because of this self-life? It's not anything else. Do you know that the, all the challenges that you have faced is because of this man that is producing it? All the restlessness, all the ambition, all the feeling of a rejection, they are all coming from this man. All the lusts that has made men restless and they are running up and down, it comes from the sin that dwells within. If you want to call it the indwelling sin, you may give it anything at all, but I just felt I should make it simple by calling it Mr. Flesh. So that you'll be able to see that it's a person. It's not just a feeling. It's not just an idea. And it's not just one activity. It's a person that needed to be taken out, need to be taken to the cross, need to be hung on the tree. But now how will it happen? That's the process that we're looking for in this particular passage as is outlined for us in Deuteronomy. Now, the question that we have raised under that is, have you truly seen the rottenness of your self-life? What efforts have you made in the past to stop the activities of the flesh in your life? What is the effect of all such efforts on self? We want to say quickly, if there are other means that you could have used to overcome self-life, then Christ does not need to go to the cross. If the law was able to tame self, honestly speaking, we should have just been teaching the law and everybody should have faced the law. But we have found that the law is weak. The law is important in dealing with Mr. Flesh, in dealing with this indwelling sin. It will take a radical step, take him out. Say, and the man will take him out. He will lay hold of him and bring him to where he can be dealt with. Now, before we move from that point, before we move from that point, let me ask uh, Sister Teresa to pick uh, from the Becoming Like Jesus, and you will help us speak from that page 179, self is not tameable. We'd like you to read that quickly for us before we go ahead from here. Self is not tameable. And the reference we had just now from Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 23. Yes. In God's dealing with Israel, he gave them detailed instructions on how to handle diverse cases that might rise in the course of the walk with him. One of such instructions is this case for our study. Just as every other aspect of the law, there is also a shadow of a heavenly reality. It is a type of the spiritual 
that God was, was still to bring to light by the time of regeneration. We shall study the shadow very closely. We now, so before you go on, let's note that this that we are studying is a shadow of an heavenly reality. The reality we now found is in Christ Jesus. But for us to have the nitty gritty of the implication of this, God is allowing us to study the shadows. So please don't settle with the shadows. Take note that this shadow is only pointing to a reality which is only fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So go ahead, Sister Teresa, for us. We shall study even more critically the New Testament scripture reference to it in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 to 14. As this is a place for the death on the cross as a way of dealing with our sinful nature and the curse of the law finds a parallel. Mm. Even for the Pharisees, the scribes, and the priests to contemplate hanging a man on the tree, that's the cross, for them to actually consider Jesus worthy of such a death, it looks very plausible that this is a relevant scripture they use to back up their action. And even if they did it ignorantly, they nevertheless were biblical in doing so. Looking at Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 to 23, you see a case of a helpless situation, a situation where every other corrective measure has failed to yield results and every disciplinary action has been applied to no avail. The only option the parents have to come to concur with is this option of debt. Mm. They have concluded that their son is good for nothing. He is a problem to them, to the family and the entire community. He were better dead than alive. Mm. Even though still alive, they have plucked him from their hearts, renounced him, and counted him as mere rubbish. He mm. is a menace. Whatever help he has been to them in the past, they were willing to forfeit. All right, before we go ahead, thank you, Sister Teresa. Now you will notice that we are noting this, that though we are taking this as a shadow, the reality is what we are actually talking about. It means that these parents of this rebellious son, they have come to conclude that correction is not the solution. Improvement is not the solution. They have come now to conclude from the death of their heart that the only solution to put away the evil from their lives, from their family, is to hand over this boy to death. Now, if we also have not come to the conclusion that self-life cannot be improved, cannot be tamed, cannot be corrected. The only thing that is good for it is for it to be submitted unto death. Death has to occur for our old nature. All I'm saying is that you must die. The person you used to be, the person that you have been carrying up and down for years, has to come to the place of death and accept this corn of wheel falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. So we are seeing that death. So when Jesus Christ was telling Nicodemus that, let me not deceive you, even though you have been fasting, you have been praying, you have been reading the Bible, you have been teaching, you have been in religious activity, it is not possible for you to see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Inside that little word, you must be born again, is actually saying you must die. This one that was born by your mother is not good. 
It's not the correct life. It is an impossible road to heaven. It must die. It must be terminated for the new life to come. If it can be improved, Jesus will not be saying you must be born again. Because to be born again means is to start afresh. That's why Nicodemus said, do you mean I have to enter my mother's womb? Because he was still thinking that to be born again will have to go through the same natural process. And just say, no. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. Now, when he used the word, you must be born again, he just to say that there is no way to improve Mr. Flesh unless death has occurred. Now, the unfortunate thing is that there are many people that we have, been, have been told that they are born again but they have not experienced the death of this old nature. So they thought that, oh, being born again is just to change the way you dress and they change the way you talk. And they have done that. They have even joined church and they seem to be coping. But the enemy within, the rebel inside, has not been uprooted. It's not yet dead. That's why this Christian life is weak. That's why you see up and down, rising in and out. Because what ought to die has not died. We must come to the point of knowing. So, you know, when, when uh, Paul came to that point, he said, who will deliver me from this re oh, wretched man that I am? Who will deliver me from this body of death? He knew that improvement is not possible. Trying is not possible. Working hard is not possible. Even praying and fasting cannot improve Mr. Flesh as many of us have tried. Death has to occur. So when you say, you must be born again, say, marvel not that I say to you, 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 you must be born again. He meant that what you used to be. You have grown this natural life. You have even become a professor with it. You have done so many things, but the truth is that that life, it only grows corrupt more and more. It does not improve. It only grows corrupt. It's an impossible road to heaven. It has to be taken out. Let's just uh, give him a moment to come back. Sorry. Am I, are we back? Yes, sir. We can hear you. All right. Now, it means then that unless that man is brought out and brought to the place of death, we cannot be talking. Even when we are talking of discipleship, discipleship, you can see that the first thing Jesus confronted all those who want to follow him with is, let him deny himself and take up his cross. You know that whenever anybody takes the cross in Israel and you are carrying the cross, they know that you're on the way to the place of death. So you can see that this conditionality of becoming, you know, a disciple and becoming like Jesus and living the kind of life that God wants us to live is right from that very self. Give up yourself. Let's put the cross on it on a daily basis and you can then follow me. Now, these men have come to that position where they are knowing that this boy, 
Whatever usefulness he had for them before is good for nothing. And the only thing that we deliver them is to release him unto death. And we are pointing to that because unless you also come to understand that what you carry, Paul said, in me, nothing good dwells. As for me, I'm a wretched man. Leave me alone. I'm on the way to death. I'm on way to perdition. Don't think that time will improve me. Time does not improve Mr. Flesh. Mm. Time only corrupts him more and more and more and more. Some of you, you started being angry when you were in primary school. As it improved, you realize that it has only increased because it's a nature that will continue to grow in its own nature. So they knew that what to do is to drag him out. So, Sister uh, Teresita, can you now go ahead? The son might have had some good, useful qualities. Mm. He might have been of help at some point in the family, but his stubborn, untamable nature was so overwhelming that even his positive attributes were better disregarded along with him completely. As we made reference in Deuteronomy 21, verses 21. So Let's read that. Let me read that quickly. Deuteronomy 21, 21. Verse 20 said, And they shall say to the elders of the city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice, he is a gluton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you, you shall put away the evil. You know, in my mind, I'm just touched. They didn't just say, you shall put away evil. You shall put away the evil. There's a particularity to it, a definite article, the evil. So they are not just saying you put away the boy. Why they are bringing out the boy is because he has become the embodiment of the evil. If it were possible to extract the evil from him and give us a different container that can carry the right life, we may have wanted to preserve the boy. I don't know if you understand that now. It is the evil we want to put away. It is the evil. And very interestingly, uh, Romans chapter 7 said, the evil that dwells in me is what is now making me do what I'm doing, which I did not like to do. It must be put away. So the first question I want to ask as we are pointing this now is whether you are coming to a point where you are willing to submit your self-life to death. You are willing to release it. You are willing to renounce it and say, Lord, I have nothing to do with this self-life anymore. It has not benefited me. It has not taken me anywhere. It has only complicated my journey in life. It has only put me under on terrible condition, it must go. This is critical. This is where that uh, parent, the man and his wife, this is where they came to. And I feel that this is the point we must come to in our, ex in our pursuit of victory over self-life. All those who are self-law, who will rather pamper self and keep it in their bosom, and continue to explain it away, continue to give it excuses, continue to blame others. And you know, self is very defensive. It will rather blame others than allow itself to be crucified. This day, we are needing to put that across because this thing that God is presenting to us in Christ Jesus is the way out. 
And by the time we are going to be praying, I'm trusting that whatever iota of self-life that is left, can you bring it out of the elder? Can you bring it out and say, now, Lord, no more reason to, 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 to keep it. It's of no use to me. It has manifested itself in bitterness. It has manifested itself in excessive anger. When I use excessive anger, it will look as if there's an anger that is good. Every form of anger, even if it looks small now, it will grow corrupt. It will grow corrupt. If it is not uprooted, it will increase. It doesn't stop. So we must come to that position. And it is in that position that you are saying, now I'm ready to let go. And I'm not just saying I want to go. I want to let go my money. I want to let go my clothes. I want to let go my chairs. No. All of those things are too peripheral on the issue. I want to let go myself, my self-life, my old nature. I want to let it go. I want death. I want that death to finish it so that I can have opportunity of bearing another kind of life. I'm trusting that we will get to that in the course of our study. Now, go ahead, Sister Teres. What is drawing our attention to this instruction is this firm conclusion from the mouth of the Lord himself. This is the way thou shalt mm. put evil away from amongst you. Hence, we shall study the step-by-step -step actions recommended here and see what parallel we can find in it for our own lives today. All right, thank you. So let's go on. Let's follow your reading until we return back to our passage. Self, a stubborn and rebellious son, taken from our Deuteronomy 21, verses 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them. A stubborn son is strong willed unyielding and incorrigible. He delights in insisting on his own way. Once he has chosen a course of action, he cannot change. Mm -hmm. His habits are hard to break, hard and unbending. Mm. He is not only stubborn, he is rebellious as well. He opposes everything. He rebels against every instruction he struggles against he struggles always against the will and wishes of his father he does not respond to the pleadings of his mother his ways are different from the ways of the father he does not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother chastening or discipline has not helped he is permanently bent on mischief this description best fits the nature of our old man. He is stubborn and rebellious. Chastisement cannot change the flesh from being a rebel against God and against his will. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans no. 8, 7 to 8. Mm. Beat the flesh, suppress him, imprison him, pummel him, it remains stubborn. Mm. So also pampering, indulgence, taming, and training cannot correct him either. Being legalistic with rules and regulations of touch not, taste not, look not, handle not, Severe treatment and harsh handling of the body cannot solve the problem of self. Mm. In, Coloss in, in Colossians 2, 23 from the Phillips translation, I know that these regulations look wise with their self-inspired efforts at piety, their policy of self-humbling and their study, studied neglect of the body. 
but in actual practice, they are of no moral value, but simply pamper the flesh. Mm. Mr. Flesh actually hijacks such efforts and uses them to assert itself the more. He then boasts of his holiness. He rejoices at its self-discipline and uses mm. it to condemn others. Mm -hmm. Self, always opposing God, will capitalize on these acts of piety as alternatives to the work of grace. Let this sink into your hearts. No human effort can deal with the human nature self. New Year's resolutions, self-discipline, or self-determination cannot stop the flesh from being stubborn and rebellious. They actually give him more vent. As in, as in Romans 7, 14 to 21 from the Moffat version, the law is spiritual. We know that. But mm. then I am a creature of the flesh. In the trialdom of sin, I cannot mm. understand my own actions. I do not act as I desire to act. On the contrary, I do what I detest. Now, when I act against my wishes, this means I agree that the law is right. That mm. being so, it is not I who sow the deed, but sin that dwells within me. Mm. For in me, that is, in my flesh, no good dwells. No I good. know the wish mm. is there, but not the power of doing what is right. Mm. I cannot be good as I desire to be, and I do wrong against my wishes. Mm. I desire to do what is right, but wrong is all that I can manage. Are you following that? That is the New Testament description of this, our stubborn and rebellious son. And several people have thought that the best way is to keep trying, to keep trying, to keep trying. No. Let it be known to you today that the kind of Christianity that God is asking us to come to is not that legalistic rule and regulation. It won't solve the problem. What we need is that experience of the grace of God that terminates the flesh in death. It must be brought out. It must be submitted to where it can be handled. So when we are saying, hand yourself over to the elder, we are simply saying that take yourself life to where God can handle it. You must come to a point where you now know that the only solution is death and nothing more. I want uh, Teres to please finish reading up to the point where we now return back to our uh, Bible study outline itself. This is the honest confession of a man in the grip of Mr. Flesh. Mm -hmm. Until the Lord Jesus Christ intervenes, the story is always the same. It is a continuous cycle. Self is stubborn and rebellious all through. All through. Even when spiritual gifts manifest through a man in the grip of self, he jumps at them. He brags and prides himself about it in self-display. Mm -hmm. He intimidates everyone around. He seeks to gain more control of others with spiritual endeavors, endeavorments rather than serve them. Self is proud of even the grace of God. Mm. Grace is the God-given ability to develop character. It is divine input God gives to a man who what otherwise he cannot do naturally. Yet self will take advantage of grace to brag against others. Mm. I'm not like that brother dear. I do this, I do that. I pray so much. I pay so much as tithes and offering. I cast out that demon. I help settle that family quarrel. I preach a sermon that saved the general manager of that big company. 
Mm. He does it sometimes not loudly, not even audibly. Self can just sit on a chair to admire himself, praise mm. himself quietly, and assure mm -hmm. himself. You are not doing badly. Not doing badly. What did you give self that he does not pasteurize? Nothing. Nothing. If you entice him with spiritual gifts, self forgets these are gifts. He mm. immediately thinks they came as a result of some piety of himself. Mm. I prayed and fasted before the anointing came. Mm. I was on a monk with the Lord 21 days before I got that revelation. Mm. Self forgets that all these are gifts of God. He identifies himself with them as his achievement. Mm. They quickly become his titles. Perfect. If you give grace to self to excel in a work, he forgets to return the glory to the owner. Mm. If grace attends a man's ministry while self remains within him, he goes on on the air. Come on and see the man of God. Bring all your sickness. The man of God will pray for you. This is the man anointed for you, the man of honor, the key man of God in the land. This is what self does. Even if you give him grace, he mm. is indeed stubborn and rebellious. You must be asking in your heart, what do I do to this self now? That's good. Before we come back here, thank you, Sister Therese. We're going to return back to read it. This is important. But I just wanted to see that self, if it is not uprooted, Bring him into spiritual activity, he will contaminate it. Release grace to a man who has not been void of self life. He will capitalize on that grace as his achievement. That is the reason why you find all the various activities. Preachers calling themselves different titles and they can't submit to one another. This is why the body of Christ is, you know, fragmented into small, small, small pieces and everybody must be the president and founder of something. This is where you now see ministries named after the, after the brother so used as if they are the owners. This is why you see ministry just devoid to family lines. This is why your wife must be the chief executive director of something. This is why your son, who may not even be anything serious yet, that's how he must be the uh, president designate if you are going to retire or you are going somewhere else. All this is what Mr. Flesh hijacks. Leave the flesh in the work of God, he will take it over. He's a continuous rebel. He's stubborn. He claims everything as if it's his own. He is constantly contrary to God. The only answer is what this uh, parent in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 21 came up to. It is to bring him to the elder for death. He said, this is the way in which you are going to get rid of the evil from among you. Now, let's quickly please return back to our Bible study outline. We are now dealing with number B. Lay hold on yourself. Lay hold on yourself. Now, look at the scripture. Let's ask Sister, uh, Sister Maria to read verse 19 of chapter 21 for us. And then we now return to. Uh, Brother Joshua, who will help us read Jeremiah 17, 9. And we now ask, I don't know whether, Therese, you have living Bible? Do you have living Bible yes, with you? Yes, okay, if you do, all right. You now read Galatians 5 from verse 19 to 21 for us. What we're talking about is lay hold of yourself. Don't let self disappear. Don't let it escape. It's very slippery. Sometimes you don't handle it and lay order and say, look, this is my self-life. 
is the one that is producing this. You might be too generalized and you will not deal with this to, he said, they lay hold of their son. Sister Marian. Deuteronomy 21 verse 19 says, Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gates of the city. Amen. Wow. Thank you. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him. They shall take hold of him. You know, I'm looking at the fact that they are not holding him like here. Because he can just do like this and escape. They are grabbing him, you know, on his, uh, on the wrist where he cannot go anywhere. They will lay hold of him. Because I'm telling you, they can't say, okay, uh, go and submit yourself to the elder. Self cannot on his own submit. Brothers, let me inform you. Your self-life cannot submit. Even when you say, I will submit, self-life cannot. The reason why it has been difficult is because self cannot submit to anyone. Self may be working hard, you think he's working very hard, is because of an advantage. Once he cannot see that advantage in view, he, he can't submit can submit. The reason why there's argument between husband and wife is that the wife is saying, who are you for me to submit to you? And give me reason why I should submit to you. You are not qualified for my submission. That's Mr. Flesh. She may have reasons there because you are not this, you are not this, you are not. I can't, I can't submit to you because you are not responsible. The Bible didn't say any because. The Bible doesn't simply say, why submit to your own husband in all things as unto the Lord. He didn't give any conditionality. He didn't say if he's responsible, if he loves you, if he's uh, providing for you. If all of those things were not there. For self life, he said, no, 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 no. We are telling him to do something first before he can win my submission. That's the old nature. That's that man we're talking about. So if you don't lay hold of him and drag him to the elder, where death must be administered on him, the death of the cross, then he will still escape. So his father and mother shall lay hold of him. So brother Joshua, would you like to read for us uh, 17, 9, Jeremiah? Yes, sir. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Amen. Mm. Because it's deceitful. If you don't lay hold of it, it will still deceive you. Sometimes your heart is deceiving you as that there's no problem. You are good. You are good. You are good. But if you don't allow the such light of the Holy Spirit, the word of God to come in, you are likely to allow the old nature, Mr. Flesh, to slip out of your hand, but it's not going to take you anywhere than death at last. Living Bible, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. But when you follow your own wrong inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. Yes. Impure thoughts, Impure eagerness thought. for lustful pleasure, yeah. Idolatry, spiritism, that is encouraging the activity of demons, hatred and fighting, jealousy and anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself, mm -hmm. complaints and criticisms, the feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group. And there, will be wrong doctrines, mm. envy, murder, drunkenness, wild parties, and all that sort of thing. Let me tell you again, as I have mm. before, that anyone living such sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is the matter. You know, we keep returning back to this uh, uh, Lists. The one we found in Galatians, the Bible says, is just a list. 
When you go to Corinthians chapter 9 or chapter 6, you find it there. You go to Ephesians, you find it there. You go to Colossians, you find the list. And all these are lists. They are not comprehensive because Mr. Flesh, who can know his activity? He said the, the heart of man is deceitful above all else. Who can know it? We can't describe Mr. Flesh completely. All I have been doing and discussing and all of this, I'm only scratching the surface because there are other things that flesh is creating. It's creating new, new, new ways of misbehavior every day. So if we don't uproot it, if we say, well, I've got the list and you are, you are taking your list, you are taking the, your list and say, okay, I'm free from this, I'm free from this, I'm free from this, I'm free from this. You have not dealt with anything. What God is demanding, lay hold on yourself. We have read all this just to help you have a pointer and say, wow, this is still here. But that pointer is pointing to the man that the man is still around. Lay hold of it and drag him to the elder. By his fruit, you shall know the flesh. Identify the presence of the flesh in your life by his fruit or by his activities. And let's use this uh, works to lay hold on it, to identify the flesh. Now, I use this very deliberately because I felt that if you are not going to be deliberate, to say, look, this self-life, you have troubled me enough. I have tried to do everything to see whether I can improve. It's not possible. Up. I must drag you to the elder, the Lord Jesus himself, who is able to finish it for you at the cross. Now, let's quickly go to number, number C before we return to read a little more from Becoming Like Jesus. Bring yourself out to the elders of your city. Uh, we are reading 21, 19 again, Maria. Don't be tired of reading the same verse because we are studying it. We are going gradually. So 2119, Sister Maria. Of course. 2119 says, Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city. Amen. Okay. So Romans, we want to read Romans 8.29. And 5.15. Can you check for our brother Joshua? Yes. Uh, Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And Romans 5, uh, 15 says, uh, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if though, if sorry, for if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Amen. All right. Hebrews 12. 13, I mean, 13, 12, and 13, Sister uh, uh, Teresita. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered mm. outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing mm. his reproach. All right. Now, thank you very much. These passages are very critical. Whereas, we read 21.19 that uh, Sister Marian had been repeating again to us. Then shall it lay hold on their son and bring him to the elders of the city at the gate of the city. Now, in our present experience, you know, I kept saying that Deuteronomy 21, we are reading, is only a shadow of the reality. The reality is Christ. And so you are seeing that in Romans 
we are noting that the only way for our old nature, Mr. Flesh, to be brought to death is to be brought to Jesus, is to be poured into Jesus. So that, can you bring that Romans chapter 5, verse 15 for us? A flash it for the brethren to read. He said, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abandoned to, unto many. Now, when we bring out our old man, when we bring out this, our rebellious son, and we bring it to the feet of our elder, Jesus, well, as they talk of the elders of the city, for us, it is not the elders of your local church that we're talking about. It's not the elders of your town that we're talking about. Because they themselves have that stubborn, rebellious son that needs to be brought to the cross. So the elder that God is pointing us to is this Christ. And what Christ will do is when you submit your life, when you bring self-life and say, now, Lord, I don't want him again, he will now take it up on himself. And by his own obedience, by his own death on the cross, he will bring that self-life unto death. But let me note with you that until you come to him, this provision does not become activated on your behalf. Brothers, let's take note of this now. Jesus had made a provision for as many as we come to him, they shall be saved. As many as shall walk out of the city and go to him at the gates, bringing their self-life and laying it at his feet. There's a provision in the death of Christ to terminate our own old nature. So as we are going to be taking step today, bring that your self-life to the elder. Bring that self-life to Christ and say, Lord, I am tired of it. And I can no longer go back home with it. I have done all I know how to do. I have kept the law. I tried to um, uh, do everything, but it has not worked. Self-life cannot be improved. I want it submitted to your death. I want it to be baptized into your death. I want it to be crucified together with you. When you come to that position and you are saying now, you either do it for me or I cannot go from here. That's when it takes over. If we're reading that Deuteronomy, which we are going to read again, we're going to read it a little further. Because unless you hand it over by yourself voluntarily, and this is where the gospel has to be properly taught again. Experiencing this new life is not an unconscious issue. Having victory over self-life is not something you say, well, I dreamt. It has to be a deliberate step. You've got to come to the end of yourself. You've come to know that self-life, unless God delivered you, like Paul cried out, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Then he said, but I thank the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the cross on my behalf. Now, when a man has not come to the end of himself, he is not ready for the deliverance from self-life. As long as you think there's something good in yourself and you are keeping it, you are protecting it, you are defending it, you will continue to have that stubborn song within your bosom. We must bring him to the end. We must come to the end of it and say, now, no more. I'm no more going to pamper self or, or defend it or keep it and bring it to the elder. So when you read in that scripture and say, bring yourself out to the elder of your city. We are not asking you to go and be looking for the elders of the local church. We are not asking you to go to the Catholic priest and kneel down before him and say, look, I just want to confess all my sins. 
and you've done that every week, you can see that it didn't help you because that is not the elder to whom you should bring this self-life. It is to Christ himself. You must come to the foot of the cross. You don't come to another man. It is only to him. He said, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved except this man Jesus. It is not a religious organization that delivers from self-life. It is not a system of uh, religious activity that does it. It is him. It is Christ. The come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy lady. I will give you rest. You must bring yourself out. And I will demand that of you this evening before uh, we go to God in prayer. Or this morning, as, as the case may be. I will want you to come to the end of everything self. If it were possible, lay hold of it. And let's gather everything about it. Bring it to the feet of Jesus. Come to the cross and say, Lord Jesus, now I know there's no other way for me out of this. I'm not being religious. And I'm not doing this because of some person. I need deliverance from this, my rebellious son. You must identify with it. You know what they said? And they said, this our son. When you want to come to this point of deliverance, you don't talk about other people. You don't talk about what others have done. You don't talk about what your colleague is doing to you or when hey, it is this person that's always making me to fall into sin. No, 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 no. Sin dwells in you. That's why you fall into it. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. This thing is inside. All the attraction that is producing sinful behaviors in your life emanates from within you. So you must come and say, be our son. Now, now, so we saw in Hebrews 13, and that's very important passage. I want you to please uh, repeat for me, Brother Joshua. Uh, Hebrews 13, you read 12 and 13. Please repeat it because I wish we would take note of that. We take note of that. Many people want deliverance, but they are not going to him who can deliver them. They are not going to Jesus. They are going to some methodology. They are going to some other religious activity. Eh? They are going to all that things. Come to Jesus. Let's go out of the city and go to him. Please read it for me again. Therefore, Jesus also... Can I ask you to please read from verse 11. 11? Read from 11 so that we can catch the context. Um, Hebrews 13, 11 to 13. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is bought is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Yes. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered mm. outside the gate. Yes. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Amen. Thank you very much. So, you know, when the Taromi said they would take him to the gates of the city, when, you are, when we go, if we are having time and we want to study further biblical analogy in the Old Testament, you are seeing that the scapegoat or the sin offering must not be killed inside the city. It must be taken outside the camp. That was why Jesus had to be escorted with the cross on his head outside the camp. He had to be, he had to be crucified in a place uninhabited. So when they said they took him to Golgotha, the word Golgotha simply means uninhabited, a desert place. Because they have to follow scripture. 
the scapegoat, this boy must be crucified outside the city. So when they have gone to the gate, they carry him and hand him over to the elders at the gate. The elders now, when they decide that they will crucify him, he has to be crucified outside the gate where nobody stays. Now, in order to get rid of this evil, Mr. Flesh that has been dwelling in you, come with Jesus outside the gate, outside the camp. You need to walk away from all those colleagues of yours. You need to walk out of all those old relationship and friendship that has not helped your life. You have to walk out of everything that has kept you in the city of sin, in the center of misbehavior. Let's go to him outside the camp. And that's where deliverance is. Let's go to him. It will look as, oh, you are bearing reproach. No, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what we are saying. Sister uh, Marianne, we are back to you again. You are going to read 21, 20 for us just to note what they say. Because in this matter, you need to also speak. You need to say it from your mouth. You need to confess, this, my rebellious son, is my son. I'm the, I'm the owner. I'm the source of this problem. It is my life that is in trouble. It's not what others have done to me, even me, myself. When you want to come to this place, you don't come to say, my husband is the reason why I'm misbehaving. No, your misbehavior is yours because of the old nature in you. And your, your husband may provoke you, but when we use the word provoke, it simply means to bring out what is inside. Provocation is only a bringing forth of what is embedded inside. So if you are overreacting, if something is happening, it is you. It is no one else. And it is that that you must bring out to the elder and speak about it. Please, Sister Maria, can you read for us? Verse 20 says, And they mm. shall say to the elders of his city, This mm. son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will mm. not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Amen. Thank you. They will say, these are our son. You need to identify with it. You need to accept responsibility for who you are being. You need to be able to confess it to the Lord. And Proverbs 28, 13, and uh, Romans 10, 10. Can I ask Sister Therese to read Romans 10? And Brother Joshua to read Proverbs 28, 13 for us. Romans 10, 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and yes. with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, I want you to mark that. With the heart, with the heart a man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There are people that say, I believe in my heart. But they have not yet opened their mouth to confess, to identify, to say, this is our son. There is need to confess. Bring it out. Don't just nod your head. I know, I know, I know. We know you know, but you did not, you don't know until you open your mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. I am like this. I am like this. I'm a womanizer. Open your mouth. Say it. That's when your deliverance, your salvation comes. Don't be afraid. When, we, when, when God brings you to the altar to confess, to confess what is going on in your life, tell him exactly what it is. When you tell him, he is not going to uh, ridicule you. He is going to save you. Is going to step into that case. But look at what Proverbs 28, 13 says. Brother uh, Joshua, would you like to read that for us? Yes, sir. It says, he 
who covers his sins will not prosper, mm. but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Amen. That's the biblical principle. I know in our present time, the present Christianity that uh, we now seem to be preaching does not give room for people to come under the conviction of sin and to, to confess what they have done. I have seen people, they call you to the altar and say, if you want to be blessed, if you want to be blessed, just wave your hand. That is not the way to deliverance. Blessing is not your quarrel with God. It is sin. It is sin. It is Mr. Flesh inside that is the enmity. Bring him out. If you have pregnated your junior sister, open your mouth, say it. That's the way to salvation. If you are involved in anything, it may be in the secret, but now you are saying, I'm tired. I don't want to live this life of cover up again. Open your mouth, say it, confess it to the Lord. He said by confession, the mouth, by the confession of the mouth, man is brought to salvation. There are some of you that you really believe, but because you've not confessed, you have not opened it up. It is still hidden in your heart. And so Satan is able to still continue to walk inside because you've not told anybody. Not told anybody. Are you the one that caused the death of your wife? Because you were so annoyed, you stabbed her. You've not confessed it. Even though you say you have now in fellowship, you have repented, but you've not confessed it. Every night you want to sleep, you see the face of your wife is tormenting you. Mr. Flesh, say, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, because he's deceitful above all else. Confession with the mouth brings you to salvation. It releases it. It brings it and says, Lord, this is it. This is who I am, just as I am. Then Jesus takes the body. He takes the rebellious son out and puts it on himself and takes him to the cross outside the gate. Heartfelt prayers and confession of the manifestations of the flesh in your life with your mouth is very important. Hand yourself over to the Lord in this way and leave it there. Eh? Just bring it out, leave it there, you will see what God will do. Jesus had decided to go to the cross, swallowing, bearing our sins. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. But whatever is not laid on him, he can't carry. Whatsoever you did not confess to him, he can't carry. In the Old Testament, when they bring the sin offering, that goat, or what they call the scapegoat, do you know what happened? All the members of the family that is bringing that scapegoat as their own sin offering, they will lay hands on the goat, all of them. They will confess all their sins on top of that goat. They will be speaking to the goat and say, Oh, goat, I have been a womanizer for many years, and I need deliverance from this. I'm laying it on you. Carry it to a place uninhabited. I was the one that stole that money. I embezzled money from my office, and I don't want to be under the guilt of that anymore. You confess it. Now, but this confession is not to ourselves. We are speaking to the elder of the city. We are speaking to Jesus. We are laying it on him so that he can take it out of the way. Where confession has not been made, even though you think you have repented inside, you are still liable to the manipulation of Mr. Flesh because Mr. Flesh, after all, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So on one hand, you are still a liar. So as I conclude here, because I'm looking at our time, and the time is not uh, my friend now, but that's okay. I would like a sister Therese, I mean, Marianne, she's our Deuteronomy reader for today. Will you read verse 21 for us, sister Marianne? Verse 21 says, 
Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you Mm. shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Amen. Then all the men of his city shall stone him. That may be one means of doing that. But then we have seen the second side, verse 22, 23 said, and if a man has committed sin that is worthy of death, can I ask uh, Marian to read that again? Verse 22 to 23. Verse 22 to 23 says, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree but you Mm. shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Of God. Thank you, Sister Maria. So what we are noting here is that the elders, they may choose that it is stones that they will use to put away the evil. You remember in the case of Achan, they brought Achan out and they stoned him to death together with his family. So they used that as a means. That was what they used to put off to kill their brother Stevie. It is by stoning. But for others, depending on how they conclude, it must be by crucifixion. And for our own deliverance of our old man, it is the death by the cross. Now, I want to stop at this note and then we ask Sister Therese to read again from the, from the Becoming Like Jesus. You stop in page 184. Let's take a little more time just to read before we draw conclusions in prayer. Lay hold on yourself. Can you help us to pick that up? And then... In reference to Deuteronomy 21, verse 19, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, lay hold on self. Nothing can be done to this son except his father and his mother first lay hold on him. It is not the duty of the elders and colleagues around to lay hands on this son, no matter how notorious he has become in the neighborhood. They may Mm. criticize him, They may abuse him and abuse his parents. They may even arrest him for an evil he has done. Yet they cannot handle his case completely without the consent of his father and the mother. Please take note of that. No one else can deal with your self-life except yourself in consent to say, Lord, I want it to finish. Anyone else who is doing it to you, trying to deny yourself, is oppression. That is not the way of deliverance. It has to be you. Until you yourself are saying, I'm tired of this old nature. Uh, Physical imprisonment will not stop it. There are people that have been cast into prison. They only came out worse. Because all of that does not deal with the man inside. Deliverance from self-life must be initiated by you. And this is why the gospel is the only way to change our society. All the correctional systems, the prison and all of that has not done it. Sometimes they give you a tag. They say this one is injurious to handle small children. That tag doesn't change him. It only restricts him. It has not changed him from the heart. He will do it again. So lay hold on yourself. You are the one to do it. No one can do it for you. External measures does not work. Let's settle that now. Quarrel with a man does not change him. Only Christ will bring a change in his life. You are the owner of yourself. Let's start going from that point. Herein lies the wisdom of God in dealing with our rebellious, stubborn, and insubordinate son, Mr. Flesh. You are the owner of self. The sole responsibility lies on you. Mm. You are the one to lay hold on your flesh 
not another person. Mm. Another person cannot lay hold on him for you. It will be regarded as mere accusation or undue castigation. Self will then quickly become very loyal to you in order to help you fight the outsider in self-defense. Mm. Most men know their weaknesses and their pitfalls, yet they keep quiet about them. But when someone else points them out, they get art and sue for liable. They say, why does he criticize me? Does he want to spoil my name or spoil my show? Even in dealing with your own nature, God is not expecting another person to lay hold on him for you if you must have a definite victory. Mm. He is waiting for you to identify the works of the flesh within you and lay hold on them with a deliberate firmness. Mm. You cannot be passive in dealing with your self-life. It is not enough for you to nod your head in passive agreement with the preacher outside. Look inside of you. See the havoc the old man has done to your walk with the Lord. Be specific. Mm. Lay hold on the flesh in your life. Please do it. No one can do it for you. And until you do it, you have not done it. The way out lies with your decision to lay hold on this matter and say, Lord, I'm convicted about this matter now. I know now that this is where the problem lies. I want to bring it to the foot of the cross. One more, you must do it. No one, anyone else who is trying to drag you into it is only wasting his time. The big problem, go ahead, sister. One big problem we have in dealing with self is that of laying hold on him. The self is very slippery. He hates personal scrutiny. He enjoys analyzing, criticizing, and blaming others. He loves fault-finding, very quick in picking out people's error. It even offers to remove the mud in other people's eye, but not his own. The mm. same sin that self indulges in secretly, he comes openly to loudly condemn so as to turn away scrutiny from himself. Most people see others but are blind to theirs. Mm. His father and his mother lay hold on him. As a wife, do you struggle to lay hold on the self in your husband, leaving your own old man to slip by? Mm. Listen to several divorcees talk about their failed marriages. You will quickly think the partner who is not a wrong is the black devil himself. Watch two persons state in case after a conflict. Each man is right in his own eyes. This is Mr. Flesh. He hides himself and pours the venom on the other. Mm. To deal with the self-life, you must lay hold on him by yourself. Do not wait for another man to do it for you. Stop looking at others. Let the mirror of God's word reflect yourself to you. Do not apply this message to someone next door. Even that again will be the cleverness of this old man. He loves to point at others. Yet behind every pointed finger, four fingers are pointing to himself. Lay hold on him. Do not talk about him or nod your head. Catch him. Pin him down. As soon as you lay hold on self with his manifestation, you must not let him go. Do not explain him away. Do not rationalize it. Lay hold on him. Do not look away from him. Nothing else at this moment is crucial. Most of the time, convictions on self is very bitter and painful. Self hates to be identified. He immediately puts up a defense or cause a distraction from himself. The way that scripture appears, it is certain that the parent cannot easily catch 
the son, this son of theirs. Self never likes to be caught or exposed. He loves hiding and he is a master at camouflaging. Self will normally cover up with blankets of religion, praying, mm. fasting, giving all and giving and all such are all handy coverings for self to cover up mischief. Self can easily resort to begging if he discovers all other antics futile. I could imagine the boy begging the parent once they caught him. Dad, mom, I'm sorry for embarrassing you all this while. I will not do it again. Even if I cannot change completely, I will improve. Please give me time. Do not bring me out to the public. Please, I beg you. He may become sober just for fear of exposure to the public, and he mm. becomes quiet for a while, so as to escape final termination. Beloved, self is crafty. Remorse is his trade. How many times has it happened to you once you were caught? You may feel bad and ashamed for embarrassing yourself with a wrong behavior. Mm. You will quickly show remorse as if it were, as if you were repentant. Most men will put up with self-control where self will be badly exposed. Mm. Rash husbands would not beat their wives in the presence of their admirers for the fear of losing their dignity. Mm. But behind closed doors, several punches are rained down on the poor woman. Mm. Clergymen, politicians, men of repute, pay so dearly to keep a public image. Mm. Self begs and begs, do not expose me here. I am bad, I know, but let no one know about it. Mm. If self senses that by praying loudly, others may discover the problem or weakness of his life, he will keep mute or switch over to praying in an unknown tongue. Mm. Nothing else will adequately give you the victory but to lay hold on your self-life. Be firm. Mm. You may hear a voice inside. You're not the worst Christian in town. You are even better than some other people. So why are you dealing so ruthlessly with yourself? Mm. Why will you disgrace yourself here? Hold on. It's not as serious as that. You will improve little by little. This is the plead of Mr. Flesh. This is the voice of passion, the murmur of self-will. If you hearken and let go, it may give you a little relief and a smoothing feeling for a while. But surely it will raise its ugly head once the opportune time and place affords itself. Mm. Lay hold on your self-life. Refuse the soft plead for leniency. You may be lenient with others, but not with your own self. Pin him down. Thank you. Thank you. We can't go beyond here. Again, I would like to leave the last two pages for you as an assignment. I wanted to finish reading uh, just about two or three more pages. Please read it and finish it. Bring him out and all the issues that we have raised. But now as we stop here, time has actually gone for me. But the, the truth, the matter is for you to have victory over self-life, the need to bring him out as a rebellious son. But to hand him over to the elder is very crucial. When I come back next week, by the grace of God, I will pick it from there. Our next uh, segment will be dealing with that God's provision, which number three will begin to deal with, knowing this. There are things that God will have us know that we have to study. And I'm trusting that we will all, uh, again, gather together to, to press this matter on. But we have come to a point today and what is that point? Lay hold on yourself. Bring it out. You can't kill him by yourself. Don't try to. Just bring him to the foot of the cross. Hand him over to the elder and say, Lord Jesus, 
I have come to see that this is my son. Please identify with it. It's you. It's no one else. It's you. Don't blame anybody here now. Put away blame game. Blame game has never de delivered you. Self life would like to keep, you know, blaming others. Confront it and say, This is my self life. I'm bringing it to the foot of the cross for death. For death. Do it. As our sister was reading that portion of the, of the, of the book, you can see the, all the various issues that were raised. You can take the book again. You can look at all the various uh, issues that were raised and let it become your prayer. Say, ah, so God, this is me here. Deal with it. And you will have rest. You will have rest. Stop fighting. Stop struggling. Stop rules and regulations. All I want you to do today is lay hold of it and bring it to the Savior and say, Jesus, I'm coming outside the gate. I'm laying it down. No explanation again. Nothing else. I have tried. I know I tried. What I don't want to do is what I find myself doing. So it's not me that is doing it. It's this Mr. Flesh. It's this, this sin that dwells in me. I'm bringing him to you. That you can do. That God will give you grace to do tonight. And then leave him there. Don't struggle again. Just hand him over to you and say, now I have come to the end of this. Confess it. Open up. First to him, to the elder. And the Lord Jesus, who is faithful, he will help us. Let's pray together. Please pray for yourself wherever you are. Uh, the prayer may go beyond what I can do here. You can pray your prayer. But let God, uh, engage God this moment. Say, Lord, I am coming to you. I'm coming outside the gate. I'm coming outside the city. Uh, take a step outside the city. In the city, everybody say, no, no, no. Pamper yourself. Don't be difficult. Don't do this. Go outside that city. Go outside that community. Tell yourself, I must take my destiny by my hand. I'm going to him. I'm going to Jesus. I'm going to the elder. I'm going outside the gate. Even if you look and say, oh, I'm beyond a reproach. Let's go to him. That's where this matter will be resolved. Please come to him. Come to Jesus. Don't come to men. Don't come to men. Some of you have gone to men. You have gone to priests. You have gone to this one. But they have not helped you because they don't have capacity to serve you. You must come to him. Come to him. Come to Jesus. And wherever you are, whatever you are doing, whoever you are, you're a professor. Are you an army official? Are you a politician? Whatever. Wherever you are. This load on your neck is too heavy for you to bear. Bring it out to Jesus. Bring it out to him. Are you a young man? Young. You are youth. And yet you can see the weight of self. is almost ruining your career. Lay hold of him. And bring him to the Savior today. Bring him. Uh, by the grace of God, we will we'll take off from here next week. How does God handle what we are brought to him? Holy Spirit, I pray that your work will continue in this meeting. And that as your people are laying hold of self and bringing it to you and confessing, not hiding it again. Lord, I ask that you will take over. Take over as those elders of Israel will take over the boy and decide to stone him or decide to hang him on the tree. Lord, take over and take him, oh God, into yourself, into the cross where you finished it all together. Lord, I ask you to give us this miracle today. And wherever your people are, in whichever situation they are, let them experience a touch, a touch of the Savior, a touch of the Redeemer. Let the load be taken away from them now. I can see when that parent left the boy, they went home free. They went home rejoicing. They said, now we have got rid of the evil. The boy may not have finished being 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 killed, but they're already free. Lord, I ask that there'll be liberty in the life of all those who come to you today. 
Give them liberty. Take the load of their neck. And take it away, O oh God. You are the lamb that take away the sins of the whole world. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And all those who are making this decision, please, Lord, reach out to them and visit them in their own peculiar situation from tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, uh, my brother. Uh, brethren, as you can see, our time has uh, has gone. So we'll just head straight into our announcements for uh, for this week, and then we can share the grace. Um, you know, as the Lord has been speaking to us week after week, um, we put this slide up here uh, the, for further inquiry or counsel uh, questions. Uh, you know, whatever you have, you can head to this website, livingseed.org slash counseling. Fill out the brief form and someone will uh, connect with you uh, in your area so that they can help you along uh, this way uh, with the Lord. And you can see that uh, this is not a comprehensive list, but you can see the con contact information here as the Lord continues to provide uh, brethren in these areas.